intelligence is the crowning achievement of evolution. Well, if that's true, there should be more intelligent creatures on the planet Earth. But to the best of our knowledge, we're the only ones. Grass, plants, and carbon capturing algae in the middle of the desert sands may not be the first things that come to mind when one thinks of Saudi Arabia. However, the once barren deserts are gradually becoming greener. Michio Kaku cites this as an example of something required by climate science. Getting rid of CO2 emissions and abandoning fossil fuels are only part of the solution to climate change. Saudi Arabia is greening its environment through the implementation of new technology, adjustments to farming methods, and an increase in plant life as part of the Saudi Green Initiative, despite the fact that most of the country is desert. Is the greening of Saudi Arabia changing our understanding of the country's topography? Explore with us how Michio Kaku reveals how the Saudi Arabian desert is different from what you could have imagined. The Arabian Desert, a vast desert region in extreme Southwest Asia that nearly completely fills the Arabian Peninsula, is the largest desert region on the continent and the second largest on Earth, only surpassed in size by the Sahara in Northern Africa. It covers an area of about 900,000 square miles. The Syrian Desert, the Persian Gulf, the Gulf of Oman, the Arabian Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and the Red Sea all abut the Arabian Desert on its northern, northeastern, eastern, and southern borders, respectively. When viewed from above, the Arabian Desert looks like a sizable area of light-colored terrain with sporadic, hazy lines of mountain ranges or escarpments, black lava flows, or reddish networks of desert dunes extending to the horizon. Between watering holes, camel trails go over the ground. On the ground, details stand out more and the relief appears more pronounced, although it may initially appear that there is no vegetation. A keen eye can spot sporadic areas of growth or patches of green where struggling bushes can be found. There is typically a breeze, which varies seasonally to gale force winds. Those air currents can either burn or chill the body. In the clear sky, the sun and moon are bright, though vision may be hampered by dust and dampness. Did you know that much of North Africa and the Arabian Peninsula is now a large desert that was once a lush jungle? In nearly 6000 BCE, early human societies inhabited the crowded Nile Valley. Many of those people once migrated to Asia and then to the rest of the world. According to new research, a sudden surge of monsoon rains changed the climate of the dry desert, luring those communities to Arabia. The rain transformed the dry region into a lush, savanna-like setting in just a few millennia. Elephants, rhinoceros, hippos, and crocodiles became attracted to the lush foliage and freshwater ponds. Before ceasing around 7,300 to 5,500 years ago, the monsoon rains that had restored the once arid land lingered for a few millennia. Most of the desert's original occupants then moved back to ancient Egypt around this time. Over a period of around 300 years, the rain stopped somewhat abruptly, causing the earth to begin progressively drying. It wasn't until 1,100 years later that it become as dry as it is today. The Earth's axis changed from 24.1 degrees to 23.5 degrees, exposing the area's land to more direct sunshine, according to NASA scientists, which caused the monsoon rains to recede. The wobble was caused by gravitational forces from other solar system bodies, and since the tilt is still altering by between 22 and 25 degrees every 41,000 years, it is expected to happen again. Yes, more than 8,000 years ago, the Saudi Arabian deserts were the lush, productive homes of prehistoric people. The ruins of these long-gone cities can still be seen today. They have been frozen, or more accurately, desiccated by time. Researchers have located thousands of enormous stone constructions all over the Arabian Peninsula, from Jordan to Saudi Arabia to Syria, Armenia, Kazakhstan, and Iraq. British Air Force pilots initially noted the V-shaped arrangements in the 1920s, and for more than a century, specialists have argued over their purpose. Recent satellite photographs and drone surveys in Saudi Arabia's Uwairi Desert have confirmed a widely held belief. These ancient stone designs, sometimes known as desert kites, are currently being studied by archaeologists who believe that they were most likely mass hunting traps. Recently discovered in Uwairi are dozens of previously undiscovered desert kites, all of which appear to have been constructed with a similar purpose in mind. The V-shapes indicate various things such as a hole, a sudden cliff, 
and an enclosure. All three patterns imply that wild animal herds were formerly herded onto desert kites and flown to their demise or imprisonment. It is generally accepted that the shape of a kite served the goal of driving or guiding animals into a restricted area using its walls. The most typical function of these constructions is now acknowledged to be the hunting of animals, most frequently gazelles and other herbivorous ungulates, maybe ibex, wild equids, and ostriches. Although more research is required to determine exactly what animals were herded into the recently discovered traps, the fact that they have been found in various regions of the Arabian Peninsula implies that this was a common and successful survival tactic. Archaeologists have discovered thousands of more stone buildings and hundreds of stone kites further south, for instance. As opposed to those in the Uairi Desert, desert kites farther south are typically more intricate and focused. They occasionally mix several V-shapes. Due to their propensity to appear in sandy areas that would have formerly supported seasonal grasslands, archaeologists have previously claimed that these buildings were utilized as hunting traps. The vegetation most likely supported migratory goats, gazelles, and other herding animals. Some prehistoric rock art depictions from this time period also show the employment of kite-like devices to funnel animals. One of the earliest attempts at domestication discovered anywhere in the globe may have been made using some kites, based on the way they were built. A diversity of kites in one area is not unusual, according to a recent study on desert kites. Some of these kites have end openings to pits, while others have end openings to enclosures. It's possible that kites and open kites were in use at the same time, establishing related but distinct hunting strategies. The development of one technique may have paved the way for the other over time, with primitive types of proto-kites preceding the more developed and standardized varieties of desert kites. To discern between these two alternatives, more study is required. Neolithic society's picture may eventually shed light on how early humans first started hunting and domesticating animals. Perhaps the first step in our species' ability to breed and raise wild herds as our own was getting up close and personal with them. However, not all of these desert kites components are necessarily useful. Some kites have been discovered buried in much bigger, kilometer-long stone constructions called mustatils. A block pattern of mustatils, the Arabic word for rectangle, resembles a gate when viewed from above. Archaeologists have recently discovered several hundred mustatils in the Arabian desert, but they are still unsure of their purpose. In spite of the possibility that they served as religious or ceremonial structures for animal sacrifices or feasts, their connection to desert kites raises the possibility that they were also employed for water storage or animal corralling. These stone constructions must have been extremely useful or prized for whatever purpose they served. They encircle the area, and preliminary dating efforts indicate that they have been present on the Arabian Peninsula for a very long time. The researchers claim that nothing is known regarding kite dispersal area megatrap users. To definitively link them to cultural facies, more dating and corresponding site excavation are needed. Although Saudi Arabia's desert kites have been well known for years, the scientific community has paid them surprisingly little attention. The ball is finally starting to move after years of archaeologists advocating for further investigation into the remains of these ancient societies. Beginning in 2022, archaeologists conducting research in Saudi Arabia discovered a 530-kilometer-wide network of abandoned motorways in the northwest of the country. Thousands of twisting stone burial chambers flanked these ancient pathways, which appeared to connect one oasis to another. A lot of these oases also had desert kites. The highways were discovered by archaeologists, who believe that ancient nomadic peoples who were seeking out the greatest lands and climates used them. Archaeologists are seeking to retrace their steps thousands of years later. Hundreds of enormous stone buildings were erected throughout the deserts of northwest Saudi Arabia thousands of years ago, and we may be getting closer to understanding why. An extensive new investigation suggests that Neolithic people utilized the strange rectangular enclosures for unknown ceremonies, depositing animal offerings, maybe as votives to an unidentified deity or deities. Numerous remnants of animal remains, grouped around a vertical slab of stone believed to be sacred, have been found during excavations. Since gaining scholarly interest in the 1970s, the approximately 7,000-year-old monuments known as mustatils have perplexed archaeologists. 
but it wasn't until 2017 that the first scientific study describing their finding showed the entire scope of their dispersal across the Arabian Peninsula. Over 1,600 mustatils have been found spread throughout the desert, sometimes in groups, thanks to aerial surveys. Mustatils, as mentioned earlier, were characterized as two short, thick lines of heaped stones, roughly parallel, linked by two or more much longer and thinner walls. They are made up of two short, thick platforms connected by low walls that are significantly longer and can reach a height of 2,000 feet, but are never higher than 1.64 feet. One of the two short ends, albeit frequently collapsed, serves as an entryway, and the other has a variety of sized chambers. It is uncertain what these rooms were used for, although there are oddly few tools in and around them. These traits, according to archaeologists, indicate that they were not used for practical purposes. For example, their lack of roofs and low walls preclude their use as storage or animal pens. They sometimes include standing stone slabs that have been decorated as well as a scattering of animal bones. Numerous mustatils also include a lengthy courtyard that might be used as part of a processional. 2019 saw the excavation of a 140-meter-long sandstone mustatil at Al Ula by an international team of researchers under the direction of archaeologist Melissa Kennedy of the University of Western Australia. They collected material remnants and catalogued the monument's numerous aspects. They discovered a room with standing stone slabs at the top of the mustatil, the short end of which included rooms. Additionally, they gathered 260 pieces of animal horn, teeth, and bone most of which were grouped together around the stone slab. They were able to identify 246 of these fragments, and what's more remarkable is that all of the bone fragments came from animal skulls, specifically those of goats, gazelles, small ruminants, and domestic cattle. Some exhibit cut marks, while others exhibit scorching. This, according to the scientists, shows that the stone slab is what is known as a betel, a sacred stone that once held animal heads as sacrifices to the god or gods of the people who lived in the area thousands of years ago. Not all mustatils contain these standing stones, but the researchers think there are enough to be noteworthy. The researchers propose that the standing stones, betels, from mustatil al-Ula may have served as a conduit between humanity and the divine serving as a stand-in for, or an outward representation of, an unidentified Neolithic deity or deities or religious idea to whom the faunal elements were deposited as votive offerings. They speculate that ceremonial feasting also played a part at Mustatil al-Ula based on the quantity and age of the animals that were killed, as well as the presence of fragile cranial components, suggestive of new skulls and anthropic signs indicating particular processing procedures. Radiocarbon analysis yields a wide range of dates, indicating that the site was occupied from roughly 5307 to 5002 BCE to 5056 to 4755 BCE. Another intriguing indicator of the monument's function in ancient society is a small rectangular stone room that the researchers discovered to be adjacent to the head of the mustatil, where the betel chamber was located. In this chamber, they discovered human remains. This is a cyst, a tiny prehistoric burial chamber made of sandstone slabs that have not been worked. It still had shattered and imperfectly articulated human remains, though over time, it had caved in on itself. Even though time had already taken its toll on the bones, Kennedy and her team were nevertheless able to identify the dead as an adult male who most likely had osteoarthritis. It is still unknown who he was and why he was buried at the Mustatil, although there is something a little odd about the burial. Although the remains of the Mustatil were buried in sandstone canyons, they were deposited some hundred years after those of the animal. This shows that the location retained significance long after it had ceased to be in use and may have even been a destination for pilgrimage or at the very least, shrine visitation. According to the evidence from the site, the Mustatil tradition was defined by the fusion of religious and economic philosophies. The combination of these two elements points to a profoundly ingrained ideological bond that was shared across a wide geographic area, revealing a far more integrated environment and culture than had previously been assumed for the Neolithic period in northwestern Arabia. However, fossilized footprints found in Saudi Arabia have pushed back the time when people are thought to have originally moved from Africa since they have been preserved in time for about 120,000 years. 
The prints, which also feature elephant, camel, and horse prints, were found in the Nafu Desert, a desolate region in the center of the kingdom, on the floor of an old dry lake bed. They advance migration dates from Africa through the region by tens of thousands of years since they represent the earliest dated evidence for people on the Arabian Peninsula. Their discovery also offers crucial hints about significant climate changes that have occurred in the area over millennia. Instead of the dry, desolate desert of today, these early humans discovered regions of lush savanna with freshwater lakes and running rivers. According to researchers, these factors contributed to both people and animals migrating northward to Europe and Asia, making what is now Saudi Arabia so alluring. According to lead author Richard Clark Wilson of the Royal Holloway University of London, who collaborated on the Green Arabia project with the Max Planck Institutes in Germany, Saudi Arabian archaeologists and other partners, the investigating team quickly discovered elephant footprints because they're pretty big, they're obvious. Further investigation turned up what appeared to be a human print, which was substantiated by research using 3D modeling and high-resolution photos, using luminescence dating, which analyzes radiation in buried grains of sand and determines when they were last exposed to direct sunlight and calculations of the erosion of the ancient lake bottom over time, it was possible to date the footprints. Resources in the environment would be attractive to prehistoric humans, so they could drink fresh water and they would also be drawn to their prey. They also probably follow the movements of their prey and the locations of water supplies. Prehistoric environmental changes caused some regions like the Arabian Peninsula to become wetter and greener, while other regions already there got drier and more hostile. The natural migration of animals and people northward in search of food and water from Africa into Europe and Asia Although it has long been believed that humans left Africa in large numbers around 60,000 years ago, recent research indicates that certain tribes may have left considerably earlier. The earliest human bones discovered outside of Africa were a fragment of a jawbone that Israeli archaeologists disclosed two years ago to be about 180,000 years old. The most recent Saudi discovery provides more proof that Homo sapiens arrived in the Middle East far earlier than previously believed. It is hard to determine whether the Saudi footprints were produced by males or women, and the dating of them has a margin of error of about plus or minus 10,000 years. According to co-author of the paper and researcher Matthew Stewart of the Max Planck Institutes for Chemical Ecology, we know people visited the lake, but the lack of stone tools or evidence of the use of animal carcasses suggests that their visit to the lake was only brief it's quite difficult to say if they were moving in the right direction or if they eventually vanished. They may have moved across the Arabian interior and into Asia, or they could have gone extinct. He believes that modern humans are more likely to have come from subsequent migrations than from these ancient relatives. However, the recent discoveries highlight the significance of the Arabian Peninsula for the study of human prehistory, which is only now being appreciated and investigated in depth. It is the sole land bridge that connects Asia and Africa, making it a very significant territory that borders Africa. It's possible that other discoveries will be made in Arabia and Africa, which will help to complete the picture of how our species evolved. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.